Racing, Dr. Matteo Caffrey. He received his Bachelor's of Science from University of New Mexico, his uh, medical doctorate from University of New Mexico School of Medicine, as well as a Master of Public Health from University of New Mexico School of Public Health. He is currently a chronic pain specialist, co-chair of the pain committee organizing various pain initiatives, and a prior member of the Opioid Safety Initiative at the Mountain Home VA Medical Center. Please welcome Dr. Caffrey. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming. We actually are now supposed to officially say the James H. Quillen VA. We're no longer the, officially the Mountain Home VA. But um, So yes, I do do uh, chronic pain over at the um, James H. Quillen VA. I'm a chronic pain specialist. Uh, I basically kind of see pe people kind of at the end of the road uh, as far as you know what we can do from a, a Western medicine perspective uh, and try really working on a self-management approach towards chronic pain management. That's really where chronic pain management is going, really including the patient kind of at the center of their care. And um, auricular acupuncture, I find, although I don't use it yet at the VA, I hope to do that. And, and I think, you know, having these types of discussions will, you know, allow for more conversation in actually kind of accepting this, this treatment as a bridging therapy. So acupuncture in and of itself, uh, you know, unless you're doing full body acupuncture is not a definitive therapy, um, but it is a bridging therapy and it allows uh, the patient to kind of move forward in their disease progression or hopefully halting that disease progression and getting them to engage in um, self-management strategies, whether it be for addiction or for pain. So uh, the way, the kind of the scope of this, this talk is, is not only for pain, but also for addiction. And I'm gonna go over two different uh, modalities, two different protocols that were developed uh, in which to implement one for addiction and one for pain. So again, uh, oh, and I do have to I do have to give a shout out to Steve Mudra, who's a uh, uh, addictionologist as well as a family medicine doctor, internal medicine doctor, head of primary care down in at the uh, James Randall VA, Malcolm Randall VA in Gainesville, Florida. He has really been a fore, forerunner in this and really it's amazing his program down there. He has people all the way from uh, uh, nurse practitioners to psychiatrists to psychologists to even orthopedic surgeons that are uh, implementing the battlefield acupuncture which we'll talk about today. They're, they're doing thousands and thousands of treatments um, per year, and it's really working well as a bridging therapy. So I do, do not have any, anything to disclose today, no financial disclosures. My objectives are pretty simple. Uh, I want to, you know, briefly go over the uh, auricular acupuncture history and kind of note some of the similarities and, you know, kind of in the broader context of uh, whole body acupuncture. This is just a subset of it. Well, I'm going to uh, go over two of the protocols, the NADA protocol, as well as the battlefield acupuncture protocol, and which patients we might choose for each of those protocols. Uh, if you're interested, you'll get to some information about how to sign up for trainings in these areas. It, they, they are uh, more prevalent for the NADA, but also prevalent for BFA, especially if you're involved with the VA. And then at the end, I wanna uh, offer an experiential treatment. My wife, Dr. Lisa Caffrey, who works with me in my private clinic, we do this as a treatment. We would, uh, we would use uh, beads that you'd go home with. We'd actually place the beads in the five different locations, and then you get to go home and kind of use, use those beads. You, you massage them throughout the week, and you can actually experience the protocol for the next week. They, they kind of fall out on their own. Um, we were going to have Dr. Tracy Carroll, who, who is a, a faculty member here, um, also implementing the, the protocol, but she's unfortunately sick today. So auricular acupuncture, as I said, is a subset of, you know, kind of full acupuncture. It was really kind of identified and isolated in the 1940s by a, a French physician. Uh, he observed ear scars and then, you know, found kind of there's a treatment uh, that he lined up with uh, sciatica. 
in quotes there, uh, developed then a, psycho, a somatic map of the ear. And if you think about kind of the ear and, and a fetus represented with the head down here, kind of brain, the spinal cord kind of comes along the ridge here and then kind of terminates here at the sympathetic point in the ear. And so as you can see in this ear diagram, there's tons of different points in the ear. The ones that I have marked here in black are actually the NADA protocol points. Um, and, and so kind of, you know, it's a, a homunculus kind of situation like we have in the brain, but it's identified with a fetus uh, kind of diagrammed in the ear. Uh, the WHO standardized uh, auricular acupuncture uh, in the 1990s, kind of, you know, defining different terms. So kind of, again, becoming more mainstream as we go. And as I said, uh, auricular acupuncture is a bridging acupuncture. It's not definitive. It's a way to kind of lay hands on the patient, kind of get them involved, understand that their body has an innate healing situation that we're trying to encourage. Um, Acupuncture, BFA, chiropractic care, all these things are bridging therapies that we like to employ. Um, diet, nutrition, weight loss, nicotine cessation, all these things we're pushing, but in the context, you know, it allows, this auricular acupuncture can allow us to work on some of those things too. Uh, the great thing about auricular acupuncture is that it's mobile. As you can see, I have my trusty uh, mobile kit here, which is a tackle box, and I can take this anywhere uh, and, and really kind of deploy the, uh, the protocol really in many different environments. Great thing is you don't have to drape. Uh, it's very easy to learn. With the NADA protocol, it's a little bit more extensive. Battlefield acupuncture, it's only a, a four to eight hour course relatively fast. Um, it can be done in a group setting and it's largely safe. You know, there is some needle piercing uh, and so folks that have a needle phobia might not be the best candidates, although we have the alternatives of the beads that they could go home with as well. So it's adaptable as well. There are certainly limits to, to uh, acupuncture. Certainly, um, you know, we don't have the greatest uh, definition mechanisms of action of how auricular acupuncture works. Certainly, I think if I, you know, if we, if we brought in an acupuncturist, I think they would argue that there are, and more and more it's being studied. And so I think there's more to be revealed and, 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 and slowly we'll get to know these, these um, mechanisms. Certainly the opioid endogenous system is involved. Um, like I said, it's, you know, an auricular acupuncture in, in and of itself has been much less studied than full body acupuncture. So again, more would be revealed there. Um, certainly, uh, modulation of brain, brain processing and the mu opioid system is involved. Um, really kind of uncommon side effects. Again, people who have uh, needle phobias might not be the best option, but you know, it's, it's also kind of good to push boundaries as well. Maybe some bleeding, some bruising. Um, of course, we have that unintended consequence of euphoria that we talk about, which isn't a bad thing. Lightheadedness, discoloration. And if we do the battlefield acupuncture particularly, you know, you can actually get some scarring depending on how often you're doing it. You can have a little bit of scarring in the ear, which isn't optimal. Very rarely you get infections, a broken needle, maybe someone would get vasovagal or a possible worsening of their uh, pain symptoms or even addiction symptoms. I think that's rare, but you know, I think an acupuncturist would argue that these are changes that you know, kind of we're, we're promoting change and, and we're moving forward through, through symptoms. So the first protocol that we'll talk about is the NADA protocol. National Acupuncture Detox Association. It was developed by Dr. Michael Smith, who unfortunately just passed away this past Christmas. Um, developed in 1974, he was working uh, as an addictionologist, addiction psychiatrist um, in, in the Bronx. Um, he later kind of incorporated it, kind of put it, put it through piecemeal. And, and initially, he was using electroacupuncture in the ear at one spot, found <coughs> that the needles were actually, um, you know, more mobile, better served, um, developed it into a five-needle protocol. And these have been deployed in, 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 in numerous settings, including, you know, nursing homes, residential treatment centers, outpatient clinics, and even after natural disasters such as Katrina. This is off their website, The Mission. You know, essentially it's a nonprofit um, to basically encourage community wellness and, and be basically get people trained uh, so that they can uh, implement. There's over 10,000 health professionals that are now um, 
utilizing the protocol. It's, it varies by state as far as how you uh, and what kind of license you need. There is, a, a in the state of Tennessee, a National Acu Detox Association license. Um, MDs can actually, believe it or not, practice uh, acupuncture with, without an acupuncture license. It's not advisable, but they can do it. So um, I went through a 40-hour course. Um, and uh, part of that course was uh, doing some community projects where we actually had people come in and we kind of practiced on them and uh, learned the points, kind of implemented the points. And now I, uh, because I've, I've had the training, now I can supervise any non-allied health professional or non-MD non essentially, and really anybody with e even limited uh, medical background can do that as long as I'm supervising them. As I said, it's 30 plus hours um, and state laws vary. I think Kentucky is probably the most stringent. Um, North Carolina is probably less stringent. So there are um, several trainers in Tennessee. And if you look at the, uh, the, the website at Not A Protocol here at the end, um, there's certainly uh, trainings listed on their calendar. So the NADA protocol can be uh, completed individually, but it's really better to be done in a group setting. People kind of, we get around in a circle, we kind of define, you know, what we're going to be doing, and then we deploy the needles, and then what we just kind of let the needles work. We sit in a, in a group, and kind of the idea is that this group chi is, is going, kind of flowing, and we're... Um, uh, obviously create a safe space for people to, to receive the, the, the stimulation of the needles. We'll put a little bit of meditative music on and people will sit for 20, 30, even 45 minutes before we take the needles out. We try not to preface too much about what the expectations are as far as how they're going to feel. Often they feel lightness. They might sleep better over the next week. Uh, but we tr try not to, you know, preemptively tell them what to expect because each person is going to have their own experience. As I said before, we can do the beads for people who uh, prefer not doing the needles. So these are the five points. Um, the first one here is the sympathetic, kind of located up, kind of in the corner up in here. Um, and for the NADA protocol, it's not necessary to follow any particular series of, uh, of, of needles but or of points. I generally start with the sympathetic. Then I'll go to the Shen Men, which is also known as the spirit gate. Then we go up to the kidney, then the liver, and then the lung. Obviously, you know, these are matching up and these are talking about organs. There's much more theory behind, you know, the names of these points, but that's kind of beyond this talk. As I said, you know, here's the beads. This is the size of the bead that we're talking about. This is my least favorite bead because you can, you know, kind of see them depending on the skin pigment. Uh, and, and so they're less flashy. The other one that I have is actually um, kind of a clear adhesive and it uh, has a metal bead. So we get a little bit of bling with it. And so patients like the, the, the bling kind of the extra bling that they can show off. So now we're moving on to battlefield acupuncture. This was developed by a colonel in the um, Air Force, who I think is still active. Um, he, uh, again, identified a subset of uh, auricular acupuncture. These, again, there's a numerous points, but he, he developed this with five points. In this protocol, we're actually using little tacks that um, are needles that pierce the skin and stay in, semi-permanent. They're made out of gold, silver, or titanium. Um, and we'll deploy these, and it can actually be deployed, hence the name, in, in the theater of action, so that can be deployed on the battlefield. And medics are doing this uh, with acute injuries, and it can help, you know, allay some, some of the initial acute effects. Now, it's just now kind of being deployed more in the setting of chronic pain, which is also um, working, as I said, with Steve Mudra and others. Again, five points. Now the sequ sequence is actually important here. And... Um, these are what we call master or global points. So these are kind of the more important kind of big players with respect to uh, pain and the experience of pain. Here's the size, pretty small tack. It's actually got a little bit of a barb on the end. I'm just going to pass these around. Careful not to actually push the mechanism, but you can see how small they are. Just have that go around. Thank you. You know, unfortunately, I'm not going to wow you guys with a ton of research and a ton of evidence. Uh, evidence is difficult, you know, to, to really come up with. There's 
difficult with blinding. I do have some research. This was out of, um, where was this out of? Well, this was, this was an imaging study. Obviously, you can see there are some uh, actually more lighting up of areas after BFA. Um, so maybe kind of in encouraging the inhib inhibitory pathways of pain rather than kind of decreasing pain stimuli overall. This is an evidence map that comes from actually a VA publication uh, uh, published in January 2014. Um, if you know anything about the bubble plots, basically the size is, is the confidence of the, the uh, data and then, you know, where you are on, on, the, uh, on the scale um, in the X, I'm sorry, the Y axis is the effect size. And so, actually I'm not having my notes, but chronic pain is the orange one, green is migraine headache. This is migraine headache, headaches in general and then chronic pain. So overall positive effects, fairly substantial effect size. So certainly after this uh, publication came out in 2014 and with the kind of requests from veterans to receive complementary modalities, um, certainly there are some VAs that are deploying more than others these, um, these practices. So five new points. One of them overlaps with, um, with the NADA protocol and that's the Shen Men. So we start off initially with the um, the cingulate gyrus, then we move on to the thalamus, then we go all the way up to omega-2, then we come back down to 0, 0.0, and then we wrap up with Shen Men. So it's kind of a, a squirrely, uh, curly Q line. Um, and, 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 and the way we do this protocol is kind of interesting. So we'll put the first uh, needle, first tack in. We'll have the patient go and walk for a few paces, maybe five minutes and then come back and sit down. I'll move to the next patient and I'll place point, the first point on the, usually I'll start on the side in which, in which they have the most pain. They'll come back, I'll put the second side and I'll ask them after they've come back, is there a reduction in your pain? Is there a resolution of their pain? Commonly they don't have full resolution of their pain so we usually complete the full protocol but we really will stop after resolution of pain. So sometimes after five, six needles um, placed then they can move on and they don't have to complete the remainder of the needle protocol. And those, as I said, will stay in. Um, it's kind of weird that you have a needle kind of floating around and that can fall out um, but generally the the thought is that these are so small and inconsequential that um, they're just vacuumed up and, and really not, not, a major, not a major problem. So here's just a picture of how to deploy the needle that this specific tack, you know, kind of allows you to, you have to put a fair amount of pressure and then stabilizing the ear kind of behind it and deploying the needle in the area. So that's the needles placed. So this is actually a study that was published, or at least in a, in a poster presentation out of Lake City, uh, Florida, at the VA there. Um, there, they were really working with spinal cord patients. Um, uh, the basic kind of findings were that overall it's deployable. It's, you know, it's something that can be done in a group setting, get a lar large population treated. Overall, I think 85% of the patients receive some type of uh, benefit, they say, and it's generally a two to three point reduction in their overall pain score. So they just did a kind of a simple before and after uh, type questionnaire. So not, not totally rigorous, but certainly, um, certainly seems beneficial. So just kind of uh, wrapping up, again, auricular acupuncture, really easy to learn, whether you do the BFA, which is four hours, not a more, you know, more intensive 30-hour course. Um, you know, you don't have to be an acupuncturist to, to practice this, not limited to physicians, as I said. Um, and, you know, the, the greatest thing is it's deployable, it's easy, you don't have to drape, uh, and we can do it in large settings. And I think that group cohesion really uh, has a lot, uh, a lot of influence as well. Um, really pretty inexpensive. Five dollars a treatment for the uh, for the BFA and pennies on the dollar really for the NADA. Um, you know there there are various there are various meta-analyses but these are again more of the kind of full body acupuncture. 
Um, for those that are actually involved in the VA, um, residents included, um, there is a, a VA Pulse website and uh, more information about trainings, and I can certainly help facilitate a training. There's nothing really in the area right now. Um, probably the closest place would be either Nashville or Richmond, and, um, but I could help facilitate that if, if anybody is interested. They say right now that there's over 1,300 plus um, trained providers in the VA at this time with ideas to expand that. So now I'll take some questions and then after that I'd like to, uh, my wife and I will, will go around and we'll, we'll place some beads if you all are interested. Dr. Hendrick. Mm -hmm. Yes, sure. And it, it's probably not something we have a way to measure, but one of the things that I think is very interesting is throughout the history of, of uh, psychiatry, there have been postulates that there are psychological factors that are driven by various forces inside the human body. Um, you know, Wilhelm Reich postulated a thing called the orgone, and there have been many different ideas about what she might be, but other than measuring galvanic skin response, we've never really found an objective measure or right. anything like that. One of the things that I found very interesting about what you said is, you know, who would have suspected that the cerebellum would have lit up as it did? And I think that one of the definitions of whatever this nebulous term she might be could have to do with the fact that the brain has a series of reapplementation pathways that are supposed to be going a certain way, mm -hmm. whatever that is. We, we can't measure that either, but we know that it should be that way, and if it isn't, we get many abnormalities. Right. One of the things I think we don't realize is how much the cerebellum puts timing control throughout all over the brain, not just the motor system. Sure. And it interacts in the diencephalon, and it certainly has a lot of limbic connection. It's like it times emotion as well as motor mm. control. So it did strike me that possibly this nebulous term chi could be different kinds of neural apparentation pathways. And we have some ideas about that, like for instance, if somebody is in hypnotic trance, they're in some kind of a different pathway. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder if you have a little more insight into I wish I wish I could could do that um, for you. You know, I, re I do want want to complete the. You know, the next step in my training would be to complete a 300-hour course called the the Helms Medical Institute. Is one of these training um, that are offered um, that you know gives me a little bit more of the theory. Um, you, you know, you t you talk kind of more mechanisms. Certainly, um, there have been findings, at least anecdotally, when someone is on high dose opioid therapy. Uh, they're less responsive to acupuncture. So, you know, the opioid system is already overwhelmed and on max overdrive. And, you know, the density of opioid receptors is not really present. So any endogenous kind of intrinsic uh, system that we are trying to activate, obviously, ha has less robust of, a, uh, of an effect. Inclusive naloxone, when people are on naloxone, I think they're finding, you know, decreased effect size. I think with these, I think you're right. I mean, I think with the imaging studies, again, very contrived way to get, give someone uh, an acupuncture treatment. Um, but I think, we, you know, more will be certainly seen uh, with these imaging studies. And, you know, as functional MRI improves, um, those studies, I think, will be done more often. But unfortunately, no, I can't, I can't say. I can sp speak a little bit to the theory that, you know, this chi is a flowing uh, of, of energy. Um, I, I think that's not a really good um, translation, uh, but I don't have a better term for it. Um, and that this energy, this life energy, vital energy, can sometimes be blocked up. And so the idea behind the needles is that we're allowing either uh, deficient energy pathway to flow more easily, or if one is blocked up and kind of pent up, that we can actually encourage flow um, through those meridians. And so it's thought to be that 
that acupuncture is, is a tonifying system in, in the sense that if we're you know too ramped up in one system that we're kind of toning that down or likewise if we're too low that we're, we can kind of bring that energy up you know, there go ahead Sure. And so the system now is not able to be effectively timed until something changes yeah. to calm down that continuous impulse of this odd energy that we still don't understand. Sure. And I think even you know, equally important is the, is the um, dampening of pain signals in the spinal cord. So, you know, the ascending uh, pain pathways <coughs> and then the descend descending inhibitory pathways, I, I think, are certainly going to play a role there, too, as, as we see with the antidepressants, with the SNRIs. Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about the meta-analysis of the Sure. Sure. I, I don't, I, I'm not prepared to really go in depth with the different studies. Um, I will say, you know, so I have this one, this one here. Uh, again, I don't know the specifics. I just have the citation. And then, you know, this, this more, this greater study completed in 2014, um, looking at over 67 studies that they included in their, in, uh, from their inclusion criteria. Um, so unfortunately, I can't, again, I can't wow you with a lot of great numbers. Um, and, I, you know, to me, um, and this probably doesn't really uh, satisfy your answer at all, um, there's lots of things that unfortunately we do in medicine that I don't think have great statistical significance. You know, we do a lot of interventions that really don't have a lot of great validity either, but we still do them. And so um, more of what I'd like to use this for, whether, whether it works or not, I'm certainly not harming anybody. And if I'm engaging them in my practice, I'm sitting them in a group and they're interacting and they feel safe, and it allows me to then kind of clinically engage them more in the process of self-management, then I don't really care what the studies show. It's helping me engage the patient. And so that's what really why I get jazzed up about this is that I, it is a tool that I can use to engage the, the, the patient. So from a research standpoint, I'm sorry, I, I can't, you know, I don't have a big gun to, to really say it. But I, I, I get, again, I think more will be, will be determined in the future with the imaging studies. Um, and you know, obviously it's difficult, you can't blind this. This isn't something you can blind. And even when you're doing sham acupuncture, you're still, you know, activating what, what you, you know, the, um, the placebo effects, you know? Um, and so I, I think it's inherently difficult. Well, but that's the same issue we have in pharmacologic studies. Sure. Uh, so, you know, I, I think- Easier to blind though, right? Easier to blind. Sure, sure. By, in, in fact, that's a reason why many pharmacological studies uh, of uh, pain uh, have uh, failed in terms of antidepressants. Sure. Pain, so one good example of that. Absolutely. I, I think that one of the issues is in the area, it seems like there hasn't been enough attention to the need for an evidence base, not only in acupuncture, but other areas of alternative medicine, which I think to some extent has limited the general acceptance of, of these uh, interventions. Yeah. So I, I hope that there will be more of a focus you know, on uh, evidence-based work in the future to really promote uh, a wider uptake of these well, I mean, I think it's got to happen. The patients are demanding it. Um, I think the funding is slowly starting to, to go in that direction with the NIH. So I, too, 
uh, agree. I hope, I hope that happens. Anybody else? Yes? Um, and I apologize, I was late because I wasn't involved. Yes. Um, but did you mention in any way uh, comparisons with, because you know, the new thing about pain management, sure. massage, and those kinds of scenarios, sure. um, and exercises, not just people, whatever. So in comparison to that, how would that compare with this? Yeah. Um, really, in my practice, um, nothing compares to, the, to what we talked about. Or, self-management strategy. So putting the patient at the, at the forefront and really kind of um, putting them kind of in charge of their pain management. So passive modality versus active modality. Obviously the active modalities of engaging in exercise, working on their diet, getting appropriate sleep, these have way more effect in the long run um, in, in treating pain than anything I can do to them or give to them. Sure. Now that there's more recognition that that might be something that can work as well. For comparing, comparing passive modalities, I mean, I think you're finding, um, you know, I, I love to practice trigger point release versus a manual decompression of a trigger point. You know, you pretty much have pretty similar outcomes in those, in those settings. Um, I, I don't know as much of the literature in the chiropractic care. Um, uh, I'm kind of... Uh, a little bit muscle centric in the sense that I, I really think that a lot of our pain comes from muscles that are uh, often neglected in the clinical uh, interview and, and evaluation. And so a lot of times I really try to get people moving and stretching and lengthening and strengthening muscles. So the top three that I'm always kind of pushing, Tai Chi, yoga, and swimming. Again, getting that patient active, involved. And you know, a lot of times I'll get feedback or you know, pushback from the patient saying, you know, I can't do that, I'm, I'm in too much pain but we got to start somewhere. And so <clears throat> one of the things that the VA has done, uh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to get out of the view of the camera. Uh, one of the things that the VA has done is uh, we developed a uh, program called Project Resilience. I'm a, a very small part of it. I give a, a lecture about um, myofascial pain syndrome. But in that program, it's an eight week program, two hours a week, they're, they're learning how to set goals, how to set you know, goals that are, are achievable. You know, the goal of being out of pain is really, in my mind, not achievable. I don't know it, many humans that don't have any pain. Um, but you know, kind of more achievable goals so that people can engage in uh, activities that really give them meaning in life and really changing the, the, the discussion from a pain score, which got us into this opioid uh, uh, epidemic, or in large part, I would say, um, you know, focusing on these pain scores and really trying to flip, flip the dialogue towards more active engagement in things that they're really getting fulfilled in life. life. Um, but in that program, <coughs> we'll go over an anti-inflammatory pain diet, we'll go over sleep hygiene, and we'll go over these movement modalities that then that patient can really take and run with and develop. You know, they didn't get here overnight and we're not gonna change it overnight. And often in this day and age, we really want, you know, a quick fix, but that doesn't, that doesn't um, hardly ever occur in, in chronic pain management. And so we gotta be patient and, and move the patient where they are and move them, uh, help to move them forward. Certainly other modalities, my wife could speak more to, you know, um, ACT, um, acceptance, commitment therapy, behavioral, um, cognitive therapies um, certainly can also, are also used in that program and can, can be developed, certainly. So who wants some beads? All right. So I think what we'll do is <coughs> people who are interested in beads, uh, to get a, a better um, adhesive adherence, you'll take the alcohol swab and you'll kind of swab up in here and then kind of down in here. So up in here and then down in here. And then just let the alcohol, um, I'm gonna just maybe put, maybe pass them around. If you're, if you're interested, go ahead and, and, and clean your ears and we'll start putting some beads in. No, we'll do, I'm sorry, we'll do both ears, both ears. Otherwise, you're going to walk lopsided. I don't want that to happen. Right. 
So we have two types of beads to offer. The first one is a radish seed. It's, um, it's a little bit more of a stimulation. Um, eh, and it's not, it's not as cool looking, but certainly I think this has the more high powered stimulation. The metal bead, um, equally cool, and it has the bling aspect. Dr. Woodside, which one would you like? I don't know. I, I trust your judgment. Okay. Oh, I'm going to get my glasses. Can I just put these on without the thing, or do I need it, you think? I use it, but you, you I, I don't think you can really kind of get it up into the sympathetic point without it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> You get the gold ones. Uh, I, I don't know what carrot, but yeah, they are gold plated. So they won't rust. No. Although you are kind of rusty. Yeah. How you doing? Pretty good. Good. I had this done uh, before with the wires and needles. Yeah. And again, once the needles are in, you kind of just take each finger and just kind of massage them throughout the week. <clears throat> the ones that maybe are more sensitive, maybe a little bit painful, those might be the ones to focus on, actually. It's amazing how many different ear configurations yeah. there are. Yeah. You know, you're talking about the needles dropping out. I remember that being an issue, too. Yeah. But she was very careful to collect them. Yes. You know. I actually have a magnetized needle picker-upper. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, and, and they're called needles, but my impression after I've been... I'm going to scooch over to this side. Is that it really was more of a wire than a needle, you know? I guess, I don't know really the distinction. I mean, certainly the needle in the sense that it has such a point on it, you know? Yeah, but it's so fine. It is very fine. And, you know, it's virtually imperceptible. Really, you know, really is. Talk about putting in needles, it sounds like that. Kind of gives you the heebie-jeebies a little bit. It does, and what amazed me is that I said I could barely feel it. Yes, come on. <laughs> they are, they are. And no puncture portion in the beads, right? Not in the beads, nope. Okay. And the good news is we can work around ear hair too. Around what? Ear hair. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, if I'd known you were going to do this. You would have shaved. I would have trimmed. <laughs> Good to see you, Jack. Oh, well, I'm good. oh I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, I'm just kind of so excited to put beads in. Oh, well, I hope you hear good mind to sign that. No problem. Anywhere? Anywhere, yeah. Okay. You're a psychology student? Yep. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. My yeah. wife over there is a psychologist. Are you doing what the it's he health professions? Okay. It's more science based. I'm good. getting ready for neuroscience. Oh, good. What year? Uh, what year are you? Uh, junior. Good. Yeah, you can't even feel that. Well, you've got <laughs> you've got a high tolerance, I think. So these don't come off in showers. You know. Dr. Chandraya, I don't even shower, so they stay in a good, a good bit. But um, for, for, those, <laughs> for those people that don't, you know, so I mean, it, it does depend on how vigorously, you know, I'll have patients where it'll be hiding in there and I will have them after a couple of weeks and they're in there and I'll, I'll go ahead and remove them because um, they get.